Okay, so welcome back to Big Talk from Small Libraries 2018. If you did take lunch break, we are starting our afternoon sessions now. Um, our first one for the day, which is actually a very appropriate one for if people did go here in the middle of the, of the country in Nebraska, we it was just lunchtime. So a good idea to have something that is physical <laughs> to get us out of our chairs after sitting um, for our lunch. Um, get your community moving, physical literacy programs for all ages. Um, with us, we have Jen Carson. Hi, Jen. Hello. She is joining us from the uh, Fisher Public Library in Woodstock, New Brunswick, Canada. Yay, international speaker. Yay. <laughs> I traveled um, so far to get here. <laughs> it did, yes, it was, it was great. It was, uh, it was hard to get here, oh, but we're glad we got you. <laughs> and along with her is Noah Lenstra. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon, Noah. Sorry. Good afternoon. Hi. And he is actually on the East Coast in Greensboro, North Carolina, at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And together they have this presentation for us about um, getting out of your chair and getting going um, and combining that with literacy. So I'm just going to hand it over to you guys to take it away and tell us all about what you've um, got for us. Yeah, sure. Thanks a bunch. Um, so first, Noah and I were going to talk a little bit about how we got involved in physical literacy, um, because obviously it seems a bit weird that me in Canada and Noah in uh, North Carolina are working together on this project. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little backstory. Um, so I've started about 10 years ago uh, working in schools, libraries, and museums. I'm a librarian by, by trade, but I'm also a yoga teacher. And so I was working, giving presentations in uh, libraries about uh, doing yoga because I, prior, in a previous life, I worked um, with kids with behavioral problems. And I used a lot of yoga and physical movement techniques to help them de-stress and deal with their problems sitting still in the classroom. And I found it really effective. And then I translated that to my work uh, with patrons at the library and it, the classes were really really popular and um, you know parents just kept bringing their kids back and being like this is great and then they were asking me like can you teach adult classes too and so I just started teaching more yoga in like libraries and schools and uh, teaching it to teachers and teaching it to other librarians and um, you know and then I started thinking well why can't we do other physical literacy programs in um in libraries like you know why can't we have dance classes why can't we have zumba why can't we have um you know like other different things running and walking clubs and so i just started slowly adding things to my repertoire i mean i'm no olympic athlete um but i just started learning about stuff and introducing other people from like community members uh into the library and then i, I accepted a position here in woodstock um as the director about two and a half years ago and our program numbers when I started here were really low. Um, they were pretty much only doing like a children's story time, a preschool story time, and not much else was going on. And this seemed like a really active community. Um, the kids were really involved in sports. And I was like, well, why can't we get more kids that are you know, really interested in hockey and um, baseball and soccer into the library by appealing to maybe more of their sporty natures? And so we started just incorporating more physical and movement stuff into our programs. I got my staff trained. Um, we have a program here called Superhero Training in New Brunswick, and it teaches physical literacy skills to, um, to community facilitators, and I got a bunch of them trained on that. And so we just started involving more movement into our existing story times and other programs, and it took off. And so like, you know, last year we had 35,000 people through the doors. So that's pretty good, and we're a small town of about 5,000 people. So our count, um, you know, and our circulation numbers went up, our program numbers went up, everything. Um, so I was really interested in it. And uh, then Noah, kind of out of the blue, um, contacted me, I think it was sometime last year, maybe the year before, um, and the year before, and then asked me, um, because he had, was, had heard about, um, I think it was, Noah, you can correct me, but I think it was uh, my website or maybe programming librarian. Which one was it? Anyway, you tell uh, me. I can't remember both. Okay. <laughs> Right, he had just he had just heard about the work that he was doing, and Noah teaches at the University in North Carolina at Greensboro, and was talking to his his students, his MLS students, about um, you know physical literacy programs and libraries, and my name was coming up, and so he reached out because uh, he was he was more interested in doing research in the field, and we talked about uh, designing a survey, which Noah put together at the university and delivered, which he's going to talk about in this presentation, and did a survey of libraries in North America um, to see just, you know, because obviously I'm not an anomaly, like there's other people doing physical literacy programs. It wasn't just me. And the more we kind of 
parsed the internet and started searching and asking people questions on social media, we, we found out there was tons and tons of librarians all over the place. Like I'm not the only yoga librarian, you know, doing stuff like this and uh, that it's actually, pardon the pun, a movement, you know, um, that's happening in libraries and we got really interested in it. So that's, that's kind of how we came to work together on this project. Uh, Noah, did you have anything else to add? Did I get most of that? No, that's perfect. Um, I just wanted to add really quickly that I see uh, Rafaela Tesh uh, is actually uh, in attendance right now. Um, and so I wanted to give a shout out to her. Uh, she is a Nebraska librarian who actually gave a presentation um, at Big Talk for Small Libraries uh, back in 2013 on yoga at the library. Um, and so it's been uh, amazing in the course of doing this research of finding people like Rosella and Jen um, and others who are kind of uh, leading the way in terms of uh, getting their communities moving through through public libraries. Mm -hmm. Yep, Rosella is at our Shadron Public Library way out in northwestern Nebraska. Yeah, great. Awesome. Um, so we're going to get moving, talking, um, doing the presentation. Let me just make sure we're moving ahead here. So physical literacy, um, you know, why should librarians care about physical literacy, right? We already deal with textual, oral literacy. You know, we've got a lot to do. Um, but first, what's physical literacy? So I kind of think of physical literacy as like bodily intelligence. Um, you know, if you think about literacy as being able to read, um, you know, and understand symbols, uh, it, this is a physical interpretation of your environment. So it's your body's ability to read your environment and respond accordingly. Um, you know, and it's not based on, um, you know, a skill set in the sense that like you have to be an Olympic athlete in order to have a high degree of physical literacy. It's based um, on your capacity. So I put a definition up here, you know, that it's, a, it's understanding how to move your body through time and space, you know, over the course of your life. So it's going to change, you know, how you move uh, in time and space when you're a toddler is radically different from how you're going to do it when you're 90. Um, and it's appropriate to each person's capacity. So, you know, not everyone is born um, with a, a great capacity for physical literacy, depending on their own limitations. And so it's what's it's what you are able to achieve within your own personal capacity. And then it also changes based on your environment, right? So, for example, walking, you're going to walk completely differently in the snow as you would on sand, as you would on ice, as you would, um, you know, on a tile floor, you're going to hold yourself differently. So physical literacy is not just being the ability to walk, but it's also the ability to walk and change your walking based on, you know, where your, um, your environment is. Or if you're in a wheelchair, it's using your wheelchair appropriately for your environment. So that's kind of like, a general overview of physical literacy. And then why should libraries care about it? Well, because it affects everything. So physical literacy, um, for example, like in this slide, I just gave a quick example of, okay, in childhood, uh, you know, an infant learns how to grasp a ball. So grasping is one of those first kind of gross motor skills. And then as they get older, they learn how to throw a ball and catch a ball. And then as they get older into like middle childhood, they learn how to throw and catch with more accuracy and precision. And then in young adulthood, they get to be more proficient in changing environments. They're going to throw a ball differently on a soccer field than they would playing baseball, than they would playing with their little brother or sister, except, or, you know, throwing something into a garbage can. They adapt their needs and skills to the environment. And then in adulthood, we think about how you would use, you know, the, the throwing the ball or the catching a ball um, differently in different environments and how it builds confidence. So if you go back down my steps here, if you never learn to hold a ball properly for whatever reason, um, you're much less likely to engage in those uh, activities in adulthood. So for example, if you're the kind of person who throws like a girl, sorry to use gendered neutral, you know, gendered language, but that's, that's a something people say, you know, oh, you throw like a girl. If you're ashamed or embarrassed of the fact of the way that you throw or catch, you're much less likely to play frisbee or football or dodgeball or baseball or any sports that involve throwing because you're not going to feel confident in your ability to throw. But that doesn't mean you can't improve. You know, my 60 something year old mother, if she practiced enough, would get better at throwing just like I would, just like a child would. It's it's a matter of throwing based on your capacity. Obviously, if you have a rotator cuff injury, you're not going to be able to have the same range of motion as someone who doesn't. 
But so that's kind of like an example of how physical literacy builds on itself in the same way that learning to recognize letters or shapes or symbols, you string those together to form words, then you string the words together to form sentences, you form the sentences together, and then you can read anything, right? And so you can play any sport, you can do any physical activity once you start with the very basic building blocks. Um, so that's kind of how physical literacy mirrors um, regular, what, you know, what we think of as typical literacy. So I have a handout here that I created um, that's all about physical literacy and how it works with um, uh, our other processes in the brain, um, like body awareness and uh, temporal awareness and things like that. I don't have time to go over it all right now because we have such a short period of time, but I'll make a link to this PDF available. And so um, when this conference is being recorded and you can get the link for it and you can print it off and use it in your programs, it's really helpful. Um, we'll post that right along with your um, archive afterwards. Yeah, perfect. So I thought what we could do is we could all practice having a little moment of physical literacy. So I have my singing bell here. So this is a singing bell that's used, I use in my yoga and meditation programs. Um, you can also just put like a dinger on your phone um, or set one on your computer. And so one of the things that I teach librarians and, um, and patrons about is mindfulness and breathing and taking care of our bodies in that way. And so it's really important to take little breaks during the day to check in with your breathing because we breathe really shallowly up here in the top part of our chest. And so you have five lobes in your lungs. Um, you've got two on the left side and three on the right side. Um, you only have two on the left side to make room for your heart. And so what happens is that when you breathe up here in the top part of your chest all day, it sends out a um, message to your body that you're in fight or flight mode. So your adrenal glands get fatigued because they're pumping out cortisol and adrenaline all day long because um, you're breathing really shallowly up here in the top part of your chest, the same way you would be out in the wild if you're being chased by a polar bear or whatever. Um, but the problem is we're not being chased by polar bears. We're, you know, sitting in the car at a stop side or <laughs> we're like waiting in line at the grocery store. And so what we need to do is um, teach our bodies to breathe with all of our lungs and drop our breath back down near our diaphragms. And so um, if you watch little kids when they're running around and they're playing, I know you guys can't see me because I'm on a webcam, I'll back up. So like their little bellies stick out, like they have little Buddha bellies and they go, they go in and out. And if you watch someone sleep, the same thing happens, like their belly will go in and out because they're breathing down here in their thoracic I'll stick my belly up, my their thoracic spine, which is where their diaphragm is. So we have to, as adults, we have to teach ourselves to breathe properly again, because we're so used to breathing up here that we send out um, all those messages to our body that we're in distress. And so eventually that adrenal fatigue leads us to getting all sorts of problems, depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, all kinds of stuff, all just because we're not breathing properly. So one of the most simple techniques you can teach anyone that's alive that can breathe is how to breathe properly. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm just gonna adjust my webcam so you can see my belly. So I'm at a standing desk because I'm a physical literacy nerd and I like to stand. So when I'm teaching it to students in yoga, we use, these are some bean bags my kids made and we put these on the belly for weight. So that when they're lying down on the floor, they have the bean bag they can feel as it moves up and down on their solar plexus, but you can just use your hand while you're sitting. So first things you're gonna do if you're sitting or standing, is you're gonna have your feet hip width apart and plant it on the floor and you're sitting up nice and tall, maybe even on the edge of your seat. We, we, want, we think about like pushing our book back against the back of the seat, but that's really hard on the lumbar spine if it's rounding at all. So you wanna sit up nice and tall. So you're sitting on your sit bones and your feet are planted. And then you're gonna take your right hand Yep, yeah, take your right hand and put it right on your belly, okay? okay? And then you can just take your other hand and maybe put it on your thigh or whatever's comfy for you. And we're all just gonna close our eyes. We'll do this together so we all look silly together. Okay, and then you're just gonna inhale and your belly's gonna go up. Exhale, belly comes down. Inhale, belly goes up. And exhale, belly comes down. Inhale, belly goes up and exhale belly comes down and we're just going to continue breathing like that with the hand moving in and out on the belly so with each inhale the belly expands making room for the diaphragm exhale pull the belly button in try not to have judgments about your belly as your hand rests on it i know it's hard we're all like oh my belly inhale belly goes up 
exhale, belly comes down. One more time, inhale, belly goes up. And exhale, belly comes down. And then you can slowly open your eyes. So even just taking like five seconds a day, 10 seconds, 20 seconds a minute to just breathe properly can really help us refocus because it lowers all of those hormones and allows our body to be like, oh, hey, we're not being chased by a polar bear. Things are cool. We're in a safe place. And you'll notice your shoulders will lower a little bit. You'll feel a little bit more chilled out, a little bit more ability to focus. So that's an example of using a really simple mind-body awareness technique. Um, and you can use that in any program with anybody because everyone can breathe no matter what their physical abilities are. And you can do that with kids. You can do it with adults, people in wheelchairs, people blind, deaf, doesn't matter. Everyone can breathe. So that's something that we can all do together that's accessible. Um, and then the other thing is just talking quickly about meditation that can sometimes scare people like meditation. They think it has to do with religion or, you know, it might be scary. I don't know. I can't clear my mind. Um, but meditation isn't clearing your mind. Meditation, that's a misnomer. Um, medica meditation is just watching the thoughts come and go. So it's the idea of it being like, a, a, you know, a sky and you're watching the clouds come and then you're watching the clouds go and then you're watching the clouds come and you're watching the clouds go. And those clouds are just thoughts, you know, and sometimes they're big, scary thunder clouds, and sometimes they're little puff balls, and sometimes they're kind of foggy, and sometimes there's clear skies, and you're just watching. And so practicing during the day of just watching that and then noticing your breathing as you're doing it, like, ooh, my thunder clouds are making me all tense. And then just, oh, they're thunder clouds. They're just clouds. And then watching them go. So that's kind of an example of of being aware of your body in time and space and physical literacy. So now we're going to talk moving back out of our uh, back into our heads and out of our bodies. We're going to talk a little bit about bringing movement into libraries. Um, so I stuck some pictures up here. This is at my library. Um, so this is the people on the um, the picture of everyone wearing reflective gear. So that's my running club. Um, so some of those are staff members. Some of them are board members, and some of them are volunteers. And um, we go running night, day, cold weather, spring, hot, summer weather. Um, you know, we go out in all of it. Uh, you can see Janice has a headlamp on. We run in the dark. And uh, that's something I do with my staff. And it's also something that I do with my patrons is getting people out running and walking. And then if you see the picture of um, the kids hula hooping and playing outside, we often have free play days. And I mean, we don't have a nice green space. We just have a crappy parking lot next to like this building that looks like a crack house. But we just bring the kids out and we play anyway. And you know, we, we block, block off the parking lot so they don't get hit by cars. And uh, you know, we play in whatever spaces we have. Um, and you know, you just do the best you can with what you have. Um, so Noah's gonna talk some more now about the survey that, that he created that we, we worked on and, and distributed and all of the amazing results he got. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the stuff I've been doing here at my library, just kind of for inspiration, but know that you can see by all these dots, there's like a gabillion libraries doing awesome stuff all over the place. So, okay, go Noah. Yeah, so just really quickly, this is a, a map of the uh, more than 1,000 libraries uh, that self-identified as offering um, some form of movement-based program with, uh, with some regularity uh, throughout the U.S. and Canada. Um, and yes, this is not a, an error. This is actually Barrow, Alaska at the very, very top. So this is um, a public library serving uh, the North Slope of Alaska. And they offer things like parachute play during the winter months. Um, and then during the brief summer they have up there, they actually partner with local scientists to take the kids out walking um, and, and kind of walking and exploring nature and understanding ecosystems. Um, and so it's uh, um, uh, just really what I what, we, what I found in the survey is that uh, there's a huge amount of innovation and experimentation taking place all throughout um, the continent. Um, and no one library is going to look identical to any other library. It's uh, every every library that's doing this is kind of customizing uh, what they do to the local community. Um, and uh, you don't necessarily have to be a, a yoga instructor or um, a Zumba instructor to get started in this. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I've been finding um, is that a lot of these programs really rely on partnerships um, with, uh, with others in your community. So just really briefly, here in North Carolina, there's a, there's a town appropriately called Rural Hall. Um, so it has rural right in the name of the town. Um, 
And so for the last 10 years, they've actually been partnered with the regional public health department uh, to offer a sitter size class. So this is a, a chair based exercise class that happens at the library um, twice a week. Uh, and it's been going now for 10 years um, and has been really, really popular. Um, and so rural and small libraries are, are the perfect place for, for this type of activity. Um, and this is just my the website you can go to for more information um, or follow me on Twitter. But um, Jen, do you want to go to the next slide? Absolutely. Got it. Uh, oh, OK. So yeah, may, the images are kind of large. So this is just kind of um, showing what uh, what different libraries are offering. Um, and you'll see kind of in response to the survey, it was actually a fairly uh, even split between uh, urban and suburban and town rural libraries. So by no means. Um, is this uh, merely an urban phenomenon? Uh, so there's there's lots of rural and small libraries um, all throughout uh, North America, kind of doing this, um, doing these types of programs. Yoga is definitely um, the most popular program. Uh, as this first chart shows um, of the libraries that are doing these types of programs. Um, uh, around 60% uh, have offered yoga, either as a one-off or, or maybe they do, do yoga story time. Um, there's lots of variations on how, how yoga can be incorporated into your programs. Um, lots of libraries are doing uh, movement-based early literacy programs, uh, music and movement, where uh, the focus is less on kind of um, getting through the story and more on kind of uh, engaging those growth and fine motor skills. Um, Gardening is a, is a popular one, working with master gardeners. Um, um, and, uh, and the other chart here on the bottom I really want to highlight is that libraries are doing these for all ages. I think sometimes there's a kind of, uh, when you start talking about movement in libraries, people people's minds kind of go to very young children, um, which of course makes sense. I mean, very young children are kind of learning, everything is new to them, so they need to learn, to, um, learn how to move their body, be aware of their body. Um, but uh, actually, um, we're seeing these types of programs for all ages. Um, and I'm actually most interested um, in programs that are targeted at senior citizens, um, which is actually where my, my research um, lies. Um, and one entity that I would really encourage you to take a look at, uh, the National Institutes of Aging here in the US has an initiative called Go for Life. Um, and uh, I've been working with them. So this is an entity that's focused on trying to uh, increase uh, physical activity among older adults. Um, and they have a lot of great resources that could be used by public libraries uh, seeking to engage uh, older adults in, in physical literacy program. Um, and many already are, but I think there's a lot more opportunities. Um, and so if you want to uh, stay stay engaged in, in kind of what this research is showing um, or uh, looking for uh, any any more information about this, uh, you can go to uh, this website here to sign up for my newsletter. And really quickly, I wanted to just, before I turn things back over to Jen, I wanted to make a quick plug. One of the things that I've been working on is collecting waivers of liability forms because pretty much every time I've ever presented on this topic, um, especially when I start talking about adults, uh, people wonder, well, what happens if someone falls down or, or injures themselves? Are, are they going to sue my library? Um, and uh, and, and what's, what kind of legal liability am I going to be on? Um, so, so my response is, don't worry. Um, we, we, we got this. Uh, libra uh, since there's already so many libraries all over the continent that are doing this, uh, we, we basically worked out the kinks at this point. So um, I have been gathering examples of liability forms that libraries throughout North America, including Jen's library, um, uh, are using to protect themselves in, in case of liability. Um, and uh, that will be circulated after the event, but it's also on the website. Um, and so, so the main thing is, uh, um, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't. I'll, 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 I'll turn things back over to Jen. I was going to start talking about your book, but I'll, I'll let you do that. Um, <laughs> That's fine. Uh, Thank Noah, you. We do have. Can I interrupt for just a second? Um, can you repeat, Noah, the um, the National Institute of Aging website that you'd mentioned earlier? Yeah. So, so it's, that uh, exactly it's, was. It's G O. And then the number four, and then life. Uh, so if you just type in uh, just G O four life, okay. um, uh, and and that's probably the easiest way. Just uh, search for that. Um, 
G O and then the number four and then life uh, all together. Go no for spaces. Life. Got it. Yep. Yeah. And so it's focused on increasing physical activity among older adults. Um, and so they're they're very interested. I've been having conversations with them, and they're extremely interested in working with libraries to uh, to kind of get their get their message out. Um, uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so Noah brought up a bunch of great points about um, legalities, and you guys are a more litigious sort of place in the States. In Canada, we, we still have to worry about that, but we don't have as many lawsuits, um, but we still cover our butts, for sure. Um, so what I wanted to talk about now was, um, okay, what do you do next, right? Like, I'm sure you have all kinds of questions. I noticed um, in the, the audience questions on the side, and I was going to get to this, you know, what do you do with community groups that are already offering fitness, you know, or if you have a national... Um, a local rec program or national rec program that's doing stuff in your community, you know, how do you stop from competing with them? Okay, so for me, it's partnerships. It's all about communication. That's the most important thing. So for example, I put up here um, some stuff to do with our local jujitsu club. So you can see me in the glasses in the middle there. Um, yeah, trying to sweep Matt trites. Um, so we have a local jujitsu club here in uh, Woodstock, small town, but we happen to like martial arts. So that's something I participate in. And um, it's a small club. It used to be a much smaller club. You know, we had four or five kids that went. My son, one of my sons would go. Um, and I was like, hey, this would be a really good thing to demo at the library to get more people interested in it. And also, you know, maybe it'll get more traffic to the club. So I started having kind of semi-regular demos at the library, or I would do self-defense classes or things like that. And I would always invite the guys from the jujitsu club to come give demos or teach classes or things like that. And it became a partnership in the sense that we were advertising their club. You can see the poster here, you know, I'm, I'm showing, you know, for information to contact the club, I've got their website up there, they're, you know, and people come and see their demos and learn what jujitsu is about. It generates more interest in jujitsu, more people go to their club and, um, you know, become members and everybody wins, right? We get to do awesome programs. We have free volunteers that teach the programs for me, so I don't have to do it. I can just help. And they get the payoff of having a bigger club and more people interested in the sport. Yay, everybody wins. So that's kind of my, been my approach as opposed to kind of working in my silo, doing my own little thing, is reaching out to the community and finding out who's already doing stuff that I care about or I think would be fun to do here. So like I mentioned earlier, the running club, um, we already had a running club when I moved to Woodstock. I'm a runner. That's one of the first things I did, find the running club. And so I found those guys and I said, where do you meet? And they said, well, we used to meet at the Air Motor Center, but we don't really have a place anymore. I was like, you can use my meeting room for free whenever you want. Just let me know and I'll book it. And they're like, really? We kind of need like a, a new treasurer or something. Would you want to be on the board? Yes, I would. And so I joined the board and I let them use my meeting club, my meeting room for free. They came in and then I was like, hey, you know what? I know you guys are doing a running club and I know you do it out of the, the local blah, blah, blah center. What do you think about having one at the library? Would you be okay with that? It's like a nice central location downtown. And they're like, that's a great idea. I'm like, you can use the washrooms at the library. People can come in here and hang up their coats, drop up their keys, do whatever. And they're like, that's perfect. And so it just became like a mutual collaboration where I, I met their needs, they met my needs and we worked together and all of a sudden the library had a running club and then we had a walking club. And then we started doing a whole bunch more programs to do with running and walking, like having um, you know, clinics to do with posture and all that kind of stuff. We taught chi running here, which is about like using Tai Chi for running. It's really cool. Look it up. Um, so, you know, I did that with, you, you know, someone asked about other businesses like yoga, for example. I teach a yoga class here every Wednesday at noon. I also teach a yoga class on Saturdays. It's free. We don't charge for it. None of the programs have any fees here at the library usually. Um, and so I'm directly competing with a business. Oh, you know, am I taking away from that business? Well, the first thing I did when I moved to town and I wanted to start teaching yoga at the library is I contacted all of the yoga uh, studios. Believe it or not, we have three yoga studios in a town of 5,000. And um, I, you can see why I moved here. It's a cool place. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I contacted them and I said, hey, I'm thinking about running a yoga program at the library. What's a good day that you guys aren't already teaching? And then I worked my schedule around when they weren't already offering classes. So I wasn't competing with them. The yoga studio across the street doesn't have a Wednesday noon class. 
we have a Wednesday noon class. So the people that are going to our classes are not not going to their classes. In fact, if anything, I often promote the other yoga teachers in town and I'll ask them to sub for me. So if I'm away at training or I'm sick or something happens, I'll say, hey, can you come in and teach a class for me? Or I'll go teach a class at one of their studios. And so the people in town get to know me Get to, and the people at the library get to know them, and they're like, hey, I really like your class. Do you teach anywhere else? And so it sends traffic to the businesses, and the businesses sends traffic to us. And so it's a mutually beneficial agreement that we have based on a, you know, a loose, non-binding partnership that just works when everybody gets along, right? And so and diploma, similar to working, people have, this, I think, some, the same kind of concern sometimes about competing with local bookstores. Yep, you exactly. Feed them. It doesn't really happen that way. You end up feeding them more business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So it, it becomes, you know, diplomacy is one of the most important parts of being a good librarian, right? Is being diplomatic and being able to approach a situation from um, you know, not a manipulative way, but in a and not in a seductive way, but in a way where you're you know finessing the situation so that it appeals to everybody. It's a it's a win win. It's a partnership as opposed to one person you know or one entity kind of having the upper hand and the other person building up resentment and then you know getting angry and then there's lots of especially in small towns. You guys are all from small libraries. You know what that's like. Lots of backbiting and gossip and na 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 na. That's no good. It's better to just have lots of communication. Um, so then budgets, uh, I have to say, like I barely pay for anything. Like most of my stuff is donated time or supplies. Like the jujitsu guys come and they teach classes for free. The other yoga teachers will come and sub my classes for free because I will go and do the same thing for them when they need someone to fill in. Um, you know, I give a donation often or I will buy a little gift or something. So I have a teacher that come and teaches ballroom dance classes for free at the library and she didn't want anything for it. But in order to, you know, continue that relationship and make sure she's happy, almost every time I, well, every time I'll buy her something, you know, it might be a giant bouquet of flowers because she's a big colorful person and she loves flowers. She's little, but she's a really colorful person. So I'll get her like a huge bouquet of flowers or I'll, you know, get her and her husband a gift certificate to go to a local restaurant. And, you know, I'm supporting the local businesses by buying flowers from them. I'm supporting the local businesses by buying a gift certificate to the local restaurant. I'm not going to McDonald's. I'm going to like the mom and pop restaurant down the street. And so we keep the money in the community and it just fosters that feeling that the person is appreciated. Um, and then marketing, as you can see here, my graphic designer, um, Brendan Helmuth, who I think is listening in, um, he created this awesome poster for the jujitsu demo and he creates a lot of posters for us. So we get the, um, you know, the logos from the people that are helping um, to partner with us. And then we put it with our logo or our information. We get pictures from them or we use pictures from the library. We put it together. We make a poster. We spread that around social media, put it up on Facebook, create a Facebook event, um, you know, share it through newsletters or put it up on our website. And it, it just spreads. You know, we had. I think the first time we ever had a ballroom dance class here, um, we had like over 7,000 views of the poster on Facebook, which is insane wow. because <laughs> there only 5,000 people live here. <laughs> so they're obviously sharing it with like their friends and their friends are looking at it and sharing it like, cool, this library teaches yoga. Um, you know, so I'm looking at the numbers on, on the Facebook statistics and going like, holy crap. Um, you know, so social media has been a real boon in being able to share information about um about programs um so i know we we're short on time so i'm gonna keep no, speed talking um i know but there's so much left to do so uh <laughs> so i could talk all day about this stuff so sorry guys um so here's some passive kind of like sneaky ways to get people moving so some some people don't feel like they have the um ability the time the energy the resources to teach fitness or movement based classes in their programs or, or in their libraries, or maybe they don't have the facilities, right? They might not have a big enough room um, or they don't feel like they just have any more time for it. But there's all kinds of other ways that you can encourage people to, to um, move their bodies. So for example, I'm at a standing desk right now. Uh, it's in hydraulics, so it can go up and go down. And um, I have a bunch of these in the library. I just built a new computer desk. I didn't build it, I hired someone. Uh, put a new computer uh, access center in our lobby 
and it's a standing center. There are stools so people can choose to sit if they'd like to, but it encourages people to stand because it's already at standing height. Then I also have a desk like this that goes up and down so it can accommodate people that need or want to sit, but people can use it for standing up. Um, I work with a ball chair. I don't know if you guys can see this. So I sit on a ball chair all day um, when I am sitting, if I'm in a meeting, and there's some libraries that will actually buy those to have in their library. So it encourages good core strength sitting up properly on a ball as opposed to schlumping in a chair. Um, libraries, um, you can find links to this on NOAA's website, the Let's Move Libraries website, um, about different libraries that have bike and treadmill desks, especially academic libraries are really appealing to students studying. They, you know, they can plop their book open, sit at their bike desk, and they can read their textbook and burn some calories. Um, yoga cards, so I have a little picture there. I don't think I, I have them in my office, hang on. So these are great, these yoga cards. I, re I review them on my website, uh, yoginthelibrary.com. Um, there's a bunch of different ones you can get and they have pictures of the poses. And so what I'll often do is just put these out in the children's department or in a common area. And the next thing you know, you'll see some dad doing tree pose with his daughter and it's super cute, you know, and you're not doing anything. They're just, they're just killing time or they're just hanging out in the library. And, you know, will they get broken or bent or lost? Yes, they're, you know, 15 bucks to buy a new pack, totally worth it. Um, another option is having active equipment in your library or outside. So I bought recently, I bought a slide, a, just a little plastic slide, like for toddlers. Um, it was maybe $150. And I keep that up in the children's department. Those kids love that slide. They go up and down, up and down, up and down. I mean, it's just hanging out there. But if you build a really cool place that keeps kids occupied, parents will bring them. And so you can just build a kind of like little <laughs> jungle gym thing either in your library or outside of your library that, ha that encourages movement. Another thing I have is a hopscotch mat. You can get it through Wintergreen or any of the other um, library catalogs. It's just a mat. You put some bean bags out. They'll play hopscotch, they'll, you know, climb all over it. You're not doing anything, it's just hanging out there. Another thing is having alternative collections that people can borrow, like yoga mats, pedometers, snowshoes, gym passes, board games, fit kits. I could go on and on. There's all sorts of really cool um, alternative collections. That's an option. Movement stations. So up in my children's department, I have a dress-up center. I have sensory tables. I have a puppet theater. Um, we have a stand-up counter where kids can make things, stacking blocks, all kinds of stuff. So it encourages that kind of movement without even thinking about movement. I'm in the middle of getting, I just got a grant, woo, a big literacy grant to buy, um, a get, actually to get a local woodworker to make a weaving wall. So you guys can look that up. Just type in like nature weaving wall. It's basically wooden dowels and you can weave if you take it outside i'm getting it put on casters so we can take it outside in the summertime and you can weave like grasses or flowers or branches through it or you can if you're having it indoors you could weave ribbon or paper or yarn and so kids are encouraged it's that fine motor skill of threading things through while also the gross motor skill of standing up and it becomes this wall that they can hide behind and use for dramatic play and so just something like that it's totally passive you just keep a bin of ribbons and a weaving wall and kids will just play with that and have hours and hours of fun. Um, then there's other health related programs. So they might not necessarily be movement po programs. You're not doing jumping jacks, but stuff that still encourages wellness like digestion or healthy sleep. Or I had a doctor come in and actually do acupuncture here in the library. We had liability forms and he like stuff needles and volunteers and they loved it. It was great. You know, so like, I mean, do what's comfy for you. If you're going to vomit, you know, that's maybe not your thing. But like something that just encourages your people in your community to take better care of themselves. Another thing I do is like we had a family day recently um, last week. And so I gave out these. Uh, if you guys, it probably doesn't get that cold in Nebraska. Maybe it does. But it's really cold here. Like oh, minus it four. It does. Yeah. Okay. So oh, yeah. it'll get Along down to like. There's a temperature and then a wind chill. We get that. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. So these are, um, I don't know if you guys have these there, but these are heat packs. So th these ones are light activated or air activated. Like as soon as you open the pack to air, they get really, really hot. Um, and they will stay hot for like eight hours. So I'll give these out at the library for free and they encourage people to go outside, you know, go sliding, go, um, you know, skating, go snowshoeing. 
it does we didn't have to do a program but it just encourages people to get outside when it's like really really cold here in february and january um and then another thing would just be like a display of active materials so you know put out a display about there's a million running movies like movies about famous runners you know um put put a bunch of those out or cookbooks for fitness or cookbooks for runners or yoga books oh my god there's a million yoga movies or yoga books put those out so that's a way of like just a smattering of things that you can do that encourages activity without actually having to plan programs so now really quickly what time are we 345 i'm going to talk briefly about a couple different programs we have here at our library just for inspiration I don't have time to get into the details, but I review most of these programs um, with detailed program models in my book and also at programminglibrarian.org, which is the ALA um, blog. And so ALA has a blog for programming, which you probably know about. Anyway, I do like a kinetic blog where I blog about active programs. And so it's all there. Um, so one of the things we do is try and have lots of intergenerational programs. It's in my strategic plan to encourage my staff to offer programs that appeal to all ages, so families or you know whatever you consider to be a family, people can come together, and you know old people, young people, everyone in between. So we have a Kids Kilometer Fun Run every July, um, where we encourage everyone of any ability to run one kilometer or walk, and uh, then we have all kinds of fun stuff we do afterwards. We do some yoga stretches, and um, we have prizes, and we give out books. So one of the local daycares donates books. And that's the prize. So crossing the finish line, they don't get a medal. They get to take a free book home and keep it. And we have a big and we have a big display table. And there's like young adult books, everything down to like board books. And the kids are so excited to get their prize at the end. And then local businesses donate, you know, water bottles. And the local grocery store gives us fresh fruit that we cut up. And so it's really a partnership with the community. And it's a fun thing everybody looks forward to every year. Another thing we do is a bike clinic. So we offer free tune-ups. We have local bike experts come and volunteer their time. I usually buy them lunch afterwards and they come and they fix bikes for free. And if it's something that costs money to fix or it's like a big deal, then they'll just recommend like, oh, you're gonna need a new blah, 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 blah. Um, but if it's just like tightening things up or lubing things up, they'll do that for us right in the park parking lot. And then we have the local police come and they teach bike safety at the same time and sometimes we'll have like a little obstacle course or whatever and the kids can ride their bikes around and it's a great and easy and cheap event um kids programs i've done a billion kids programs but here's just two ones that i that i thought of off the top of my head was a nerf battle so we bought a bunch of nerf guns and we also encouraged kids to bring nerf guns from home and my summer reading club student last year ebony designed a whole nerf war thing <laughs> program for them and they did obstacle courses and they shot at targets and they played capture the flag and they did they had so much fun like so 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 much fun and uh, I was I was so impressed by how many girls came and they were like awesome shooters so it was like they did a really good job um and then we did a library mini golf here one year so you can see on the on the uh I guess it would be the left <laughs> right hand side for me um of uh Kate one of my staff members clapping because um one of the little girls from the library just got uh you know she got her hole in one um so we just set up stuff right in the stacks and we just used books and other things we had plants things we had sitting around the library to create an 18 hole golf course in the library and we just bought plastic dollar store golf clubs i think the whole program cost us 20 dollars um we had 80 people come <laughs> to play mini golf in the library <laughs> so super fun super cheap really easy didn't take that much time to set up. Um, teens, uh, sometimes teens are not the easiest to market to or get interested in um, at coming to programs. Yoga and meditation seems to be a really good draw, I find in our library for teens. Uh, something I did when I worked at, I ran the Hampton High School Library in Hampton is called the Library Guild. You can see that there on the left we were doing archery in the gym. So I actually created a medieval guild style thing at the library. It started as like a volunteer program. Like, you know, you come to the library, you volunteer to work as a page and you belong to the guild and you can like rank up. I kind of set it like a, a video game or um, like that to get them interested. But really it just became about having fun to do with medieval stuff. So we built medieval models. We had a like 
we got I even got the cafeteria ladies in they they made us a whole medieval feast and we dressed up for it in medieval clothes and we ate with our hands like because we wouldn't we're not allowed to use spoons and like we had so much fun and so it started off as being like yeah you're gonna come in and volunteer at the library and you know get some volunteer hours and it just became this huge thing we did like pool noodle jousting and you know we, we just had a great time and then the like this were kind of I started by doing it with the like more socially awkward kids some of whom were on the spectrum the kids that were always hanging out at the library but like weren't talking to each other they would maybe like one or two would play magic in the corner and others would just like read by themselves and i could see all these kids and they like desperately wanted friends but they just were having such a hard time connecting and i was like their best friend they would come in and talk to the librarian but like they really were having a hard time connecting with their peers and so this was a great opportunity i kind of asked them all first like what are you guys interested in and it was like graphic novels manga you know card games video games things like that and so i was trying to think of like a theme a common theme and we went with medieval stuff and that got them all in, in costumes because they love cosplay and so that got them really interested and then by the end of it they were all friends and i even found like the jock kids coming in and wanting to like pool noodle joust with us and do some stuff with us and it became like the library became a cool place to hang out <laughs> i don't know how that happened but it did um you know and so so finding what the teens were interested in and then working from there. Um, and then of course, grown-ups still like to play. So here's an example of our, our running club. We had some people come down from Montreal and teach us how to do chi running and chi walking. You can check it out, they have a website. Um, Danny Dreyer is the guy that started it. And it's a way of running the, to, um, to lower your risk of injury. Um, and then on the right here, you can see this is me teaching um, seated yoga to knitters. So there's a knitting conference that happens in Woodstock every year. I taught at it this year too. And I go over there, it's called the winter wool gathering. And I go over and I teach yoga to the knitters. And so, you know, these are not people that do a whole lot of, many of them don't do a whole lot of physical activity, but I help them, you know, limber up their hands and their shoulders while they're knitting all day. And then I get to talk about library programs while I'm there and show off all our library knitting books. So win-win. Um, and then, of course, we always do lots of dancing programs. So we do lots of ballroom dance, belly dance. Um, I have, have had kids after school dance programs here. Uh, Noah, I don't know if we have time, but if you look on Noah's website, um, he has lists to other libraries that are doing all kinds of fun dance and aerobics programs and all kinds of stuff. So there's lots of, um, lots of inspiration to look for if you're interested in teaching dance classes at your library and i just use local dance instructors that are willing to volunteer their time i'm not a dance teacher i've taken the dance classes they're hilarious i'm terrible at it <laughs> you know but you know you don't have to be a dance instructor you can find those people in your community um and then another thing that i wanted to mention is in reach and outreach so we go out into the community it's really important to not just do stuff at your library but to go and you know i'll go and teach yoga programs at daycares i will go and teach um, programs like i said at the wool gathering or i'll go to nursing homes and teach chair yoga i went and went to the colostomy clinic at the at the hospital and taught people how to do gentle yoga that all had um, ostomies um, and uh, you know that, that's important and they get to find out about library programs um, and uh, what what services were available to them so don't be afraid to go outside of your walls of your building and then also um, I don't have time to get into it right now this would be a whole other workshop but uh, how to adapt your programs to people with limited mobility or people that have cognitive disabilities there's a whole section in my book about um, doing that I've written some blog posts about it too you can also email me and I can help you if you have specific patrons you need to modify things for I'd be more than happy to um, but yeah don't be afraid that um, you won't be able to appeal to everyone because people have different abilities everyone has exceptions and so trying to make your programs as accessible as possible is really key and also keeping the cost down so that there is no cost to your programs because there's so many members of your community that probably can't afford a gym membership they can't afford to join the rec club they can't send their kids to baseball camp so having opportunities in your community to um offer people this ability to use their bodies um, is a real service that we're providing um, as libraries we're community centers right and so we're appealing to the whole person i consider it whole person literacy and not just um not just appealing to kind of textual literacy that we're used to um and then don't forget your staff 
So I have a, a webinar that I did for the American Library Association. Uh, it's at the bottom there. There's a link taking care of us. And that's a webinar you can watch all about things that you can do for self care. I also have, um, I'll put this up here. This is like a little handout um, of tips that you have um, that you can do to take care of yourself. Because uh, librarians were givers, right? We're people pleasers. We we love taking care of people, even when we resent it and get stressed out and overwhelmed. Um, that's our natural bent, right? That's why you go into library because you're service oriented. But the problem is, is that we don't take care of ourselves. <laughs> We're spending so much time taking care of other people, we forget to look after ourselves. So um, these are just some stats. I used to teach a yoga break when I worked at the York Provincial Office when I ran the bookmobile service. And um, you can see just 15 minutes, I would teach yoga 15 minutes once a week. And 100% of the participants felt more focused afterwards, after just 15 minutes once a week. Um, they felt more connected, they felt more grounded, they had, they were more mindful, and they had more energy. Um, so it really boosts productivity. So if you're a library director like I am, or you work in administration, it's to your best interest to get your staff involved in physical activity as well. Like my staff, one of my staff's husbands, who's um, not an active fit guy by any stretch of the imagination, now comes to my Saturday morning yoga classes and his wife, who's my staff member, who is also not a physically active person, just talked about joining a gym. And I was like, "Woo, OK, so it's taken like two years of me being here. But like my harping on movement is finally, hopefully, rubbing off a little bit. And so you'll be surprised at um, how much more engaged your staff will be when they're feeling good about their bodies. Um, and then we don't have time to do a lot of yoga. We've got like four minutes left. Um, but I have a video here and I also have a handout. So this is a handout of de-stress at your desk, some stuff you can do right at your desk. And then I also have a link to a video that I made, um, de-stress at your desk. And so you can watch the video and follow along with me and do the movements, or you can get the PDF, which we will uh, send you. And you can um, print off the PDF and stick it up next to your workstation or give it to your staff. And that's something they can do. So we're just gonna do one thing really quick together, just to work out our hands, because librarians use our hands all the time for typing. So if everybody wants to stick their hands up with me, mm -hmm. okay? So you're gonna send your hands up and then send them down. And then send them up like and send them down. And up and down and up <laughs> and down. <laughs> There's a, it's a time delay. That's what we'll say. And up <laughs> and down and up and down. Good. And now we're going to go out and in and out and in and out and in and out and in. And then pull them in really tight. Send them out. Send and pull them in tight. Send them out. And then do that a few more times. Just flick them like you're flicking water at somebody you don't like. Flick, 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 flick. flick. Yeah. <laughs> ten, 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 ten. And then flick like as fast as you can. You'll feel it in the tendons in your arms. Click, 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 click. I know, it kills, right? <laughs> when I used to work at the College of Craft and Design, I taught this like six times a day. And my hands would be, I was like a motorcycle mama by the end of it. My arms are so sick. <laughs> and then, okay, shake that out. And then bring your hands up and take your ring finger and your thumb together. Ring finger, thumb. Okay, and we're gonna do little circles with the wrists. This is for those, for that carpal tunnel. Mm. Yeah, and then circles this way. Good. And then you're going to, ready? Okay. You're going to scrunch those shoulders up and drop. Scrunch them up and drop. You have to make that face while you do it. Scrunch, scrunch, scrunch <laughs> and drop. Good. And then bring your hands back up and then we're going to flip the wrists back and forth. This is for these guys. Yeah. And then you flick the wrists back and forth and you can see mine moving. Flick them back and forth. There. And you just roll your shoulders a little bit. So even just taking, what did that take? A minute? Just taking mm -hmm. a minute to just work out your hands and work out your shoulders before you get back to your, you know, keyboard warrioring. Um, we'll just, it's great. Uh, so feel free to check out that video and print off that PDF and do mm -hmm. some exercises at your desk. Share it with your staff. Uh, Noah and I put some links up here for you guys. So Yoga in the Library is my website. Um, Programming Librarian is where I blog for the American Library Association. Active for Life is this great resource. It's a Canadian company. I've got some bookmarks from them right here to show you. They will send you these bookmarks for free. Um, 
and they'll send you t-shirts and all kinds of stuff. They're a nonprofit that's uh, dedicated to promoting physical literacy. And these are great. They have them in French and English. We speak French here in Canada. Um, I'm sure there's some parts of the States where you guys speak French. I don't think they have them in Spanish, but you could ask. Um, but these are great to hand out. Uh, and put them in people's books and get physical literacy on their mind. Let's Move Libraries is NOAA's website. Sport for Life is a uh, Manitoba-based um, initiative for encouraging uh, physical literacy and physical literacy for life as well. Um, and then you can see my, my youngest son here talking to a banana. That banana is my friend Sarah, who is an author who talks about um, uh, nutrition. So that's another example is you can have uh, uh, authors come into your community, come into your library, and talk about their books that they write about um, nutrition and well, uh, health, health and wellness and things like that. Sometimes they'll even come in costume. And segueing into talking about books, if you wanted to learn more about uh, offering physical literacy programs in your community, I recently released a book um, on the subject from the American Library Association. It's not coming out until June, but you can pre-order it now. I even have a coupon from the publishers, so my email is on the bottom there. If you want to email me, I will email you a coupon. And Noah write an, wrote an awesome foreword for it. And uh, Dr. Denise Augusto, who specializes in youth programs from Drexel University, where I'm alumni, um, she wrote the afterword for me, and it's an excellent mm -hmm. afterword. So you can check that book out if you would like. Great. That's it. Okay. Do we, Thank woo, you. We finished much. our time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jenna and Noah. That was no that problem. was great. Um, a lot of good info, getting me feeling more energized from my okay. workout, but also a little guilty that I don't do it often enough. <laughs> no, no guilt, no guilt. Move forward. Uh, we do have one person commented that they are doing um, with along with the Olympics. That's a perfect uh, mm. connection. Yeah. Um, their library's youth department has been doing all Olympic events during the Olympics. They've That's got awesome. a child. A record is of of a child hula hooping is twenty minutes. Wow. 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 I, I would do that. die from that. Uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing tabletop curling, uh, wee right. ski jumping, uh, puck delivering, except et cetera, a whole bunch of creative things. Yeah. Great, great. That's awesome. All right. All right. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Um, we are going to switch over.